helicopter strike or when um, uh, when a typhoon strikes or when earthquakes strike, then it becomes uh, really important because we find a number of houses and even buildings in the disaster hit areas having gone down and primarily because of substandard steel. So this is not acceptable uh, in our market where uh, Filipinos work very hard no, to buy these materials to put up their houses. No? In fact, when I was in Bohol a few weeks ago, you could see houses side by side. Um, one was, uh, one nagiba, no? talagang uh, fell apart, and the house right beside it stood strongly. And you get to wonder, how can two very similar houses in practically the same area have such a big difference in terms of the results of the earthquake. And uh, upon further um, investigation or asking around, you find that um, if you use the wrong type of steel at the wrong part of your house, that can really uh, be the cost, no? or that can really uh, result in uh, structure side by side, um, having very different results from the same occurrence. Uh, when we went around in Bohol, the governor actually said, uh, alam nyo, Senator, wala namang namamatay sa earthquake, na earthquake dahil uh, lumilindol. Namamatay sila dahil nahuhulugan ng mga dingding o nahuhulugan ng mga bagay-bagay. And uh, the experience in Yolanda was uh, also the same, no? that there were houses that collapsed on people. And unfortunately, um, houses and uh, institutions and buildings collapsed on people and caused so many deaths. And uh, we have to go back and ask ourselves, how did this happen? No? Of course, um, it's a different matter. If we use the right steel, we had the right, um, we had the right standards, but um, let's say the earthquake or even the typhoon was too grave, no? which means we need to change the standards by which we uh, currently um, follow. And maybe DTI uh, can help us with that. If there's a need to actually uh, put up the standards of our steel no? and uh, other materials in the Philippines, it's another matter altogether if people bought steel thinking that it was of the right quality, but in effect, they were fooled because they had bought uh, a lower quality at the price of which they expect the right quality. I was also able to talk to some hardware, man, uh, hardware uh, store owners, and they said that even in their case, uh, if they measure some of the rebars that are uh, currently in their stores, no? Uh, sabi ho nila, 10 millimeter yan sa gitna, pero sa dulo, baka 8 millimeter na. No? And that, again, comprises fraud. Now, if you look at um, this type of fraudulent behavior, and you look at the outcome, which are people's lives getting uh, lost, then you get to wonder uh, why this issue isn't uh, even more in the public's eye. So, our, our goal here is to look at uh, basically how uh, substandard steel gets into the market, whether it's imported, made here, mislabeled. Uh, you've had reports where um, the, uh, the steel that is supposed to be used for wiring is used for rebars, etc., etc. We'll be tackling all of that today. But at the end of the hearing, and since this is an investigation, uh, we, don't, we still don't have uh, accompanying legislation to actually push for the reforms. Hopefully, we can have, that, um, have some recommendations by the end of the hearing. I hope we can talk about how we can tighten the, the security and uh, make sure that uh, the steel in the market is really of the right quality. I'm also hoping that our friends in media can also put out the message that for our, Fili for our Filipino countrymen who are saving up their hard-earned money to put up a new part of their house or to convert um, their houses into concrete houses that they use the right materials and that they're able to check you know, properly what they need to check to make sure that uh, their hard-earned money goes to the right standard. So, um, of course, in many ways, I think I'm preaching to the choir because everyone here is uh, in favor of having the right materials and the right standards in the market. but. Uh, I would request all of the uh, individuals here to focus on solutions. No? What can we do better? Because if 25% of the market for rebars is indeed substandard, then we're not doing something right. No? Either may nakakalusot or hindi natin na check or um, nagagamit yung maybe some of our facilities nagagamit in the wrong way. These are things we need to uh, talk about today and hopefully after talking about all of these issues, we can actually come up with real solutions to tighten 
um, the standards by which we uh, sell our products. I mean, we actually invited uh, Mr. Juan here to give an overview also of, uh, of quality. You know? Because um, more and more, uh, our market is demanding, and rightfully so, no, the right quality for the right price. And I guess that's the right of every consumer no, to get the right quality at the right price. So we'll be talking about that also as well. We'll be asking them to give a presentation. Okay, so we'll be um, starting with uh, PISA. Yeah. Uh, so Philippine Iron and uh, Steel Institute will uh, start the presentation. PISA is represented by... Mr. Cola, no? Okay, so we'll start with Mr. Cola. Then, um, so we're following the, the Are we following the alphabetically? You know, are we following this? Uh, okay. So we'll start with PISA, then we'll go to Bureau of Customs, no? It's Mr. Tolentino. And then uh, DTI, is that uh, Yusek Limagiba? We'll present. And then um, uh, Mr. Juan will present. And then later on, we'll open the floor for anyone who wants to add uh, other things. Now, if Mr. Bernardino or Mr. Fodolig want to add anything, Jose Cordero, you could also share your experiences in the Yolanda hit areas. No? Um, then we'll open it up for discussion. And again, much like all of the other hearings we've had uh, in the Committee of uh, Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship, we hope that this will be constructive. But no pun intended, it's constructive. No? We hope it's constructive. At, um, later on, we can also detail what type of measures we can do together you know, to see how we can stop the, uh, the proliferation of substandard steel in the market. Okay, um, I also request that we keep the presentation to about uh, 10 minutes. No, we'll have, I'll, I'll be a little strict on this because uh, there are a lot of people who are presenting. So I will cut you in about 10 minutes and 30 15 seconds. So please stick to the point and um, let's forego many of the uh, introductory slides. Now let's go straight to the point regarding uh, substandard steel in the market. Mr. Kola. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor, for giving us this opportunity to present our industry's concerns in particular and the Filipino consumers in general. My presentation will discuss the proliferation of substandard steel and the rampant smuggling of steel products. These two problems are related the impact on job preservation and generation, and more importantly, on public safety. Let me start with a short overview of the steel industry and the corresponding mandatory steel standards. This will provide a framework and help us understand our problems of substandard steel and smuggling of steel products. Construction is an important activity for a developing country like us. Steel being a necessary input for construction, is key for maintaining this investment. So there must be a cooperation between steel industry and the government to ensure that both fulfill its roles in economic progress. This slide shows that the Philippines is on the take-off stage. There's a relationship between the uh, steel consumption and the GDP per capita. Compared to ASEAN neighbors, like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines is at the bottom with Indonesia, but as I said, we are on the takeoff stage. This is an industry structure just to illustrate that there are two sectors in the industry, the long products, which is the problematic sector, and the flat products, which is already a dying sector. In terms of profile, the power steel consumption has increased by 65% from 2010 to 2013. This is one of the fastest growing industry in the country today. Now let me go to the impact of substandard steel and smuggling. Impact on industry, impact on the country. Impact on the industry. It prevents the development of the domestic steel industry, making it uncompetitive, especially vulnerable to China and the ASEAN economic community. It affects employment of more than 50,000 people. It affects the current and future investments especially the foreign direct investments, which we badly need. From the study of CRC, University of Asia and Pacific, every new investment of 100 million leads to higher domestic output of 260 million, household income of 24 million, and additional 117 direct regular jobs. On the country, 
structures with infor inferior and substandard building material cost lives, especially situations of earthquake and other natural calamities. These are the pictures of Yolanda taken in Tacloban and pictures of earthquake in Cebu as well as in Samar. Impact on the country. It impedes GDP growth of the country. It borders the country with higher cost of construction. Therefore, it is anti-poor. It is uh, false economy actually by using substandard steel. It's cheaper, but in the long run, it will be more expensive. It poses high risk for all of us. It violates every Filipino's constitutional, constitutional right to life and property. Now, what is mandatory standard? St most of the steel materials are covered by mandatory standards, and this means that it affects life, health, and safety of the general public. For locally manufactured products, it requires a PS license from DTI. And for imported products, it requires ICC from DTI. Therefore, enforcement is essential to attain this, the protection of the public. These are the pictures of the steel products that are covered by mandatory standards. Here we have the uh, roofing material, pipes and tubes, nails, steel angles, steel wires, and reinforcing bars. Let me go to the proliferation of substandard steel. This is the local manufacture, importation, and sale of substandard steel products. Manufacture, importation, and sale of substandard products. What is the nature? It is non-compliance non with mandatory PNS marking, weight, dimension, and coating. The reason is to defraud the public for personal gain. Gain and fair competitive advantage, maximize profits. Now, this is the manufacture and sale of substandard products using wire rods, which is, I think, the most hideous today. Use of wire rods to produce PNS bars. The reason is because this uh, material is artificially cheap in the market today. It incurs less processing cost. Last year, there was a 100% jump in wire importation, and more than 300,000 tons of wire rods are suspected to be converted into rebars. Let me go to the remedies of the sale of substandard products. First, we propose to strengthen the market monitoring and enforcement, meaning apply consistent policies, strengthen pertinent laws or DAOs as needed, include regular warehouse inspection, because this is not included uh, today, confiscate all substandard products found. Second, destroy all con confiscated products if confirmed to be substandard. Third, prohibit the change of business name of establishments caught violating standards laws. This is a reality. If an uh, establishment is caught uh, selling substandard products, they just change names. Fourth, amend 7103 and add selling substandard products to be covered by penalty in Section 10, similar to those of smuggling steel products. Now, this is the remedy proposed for the man manufacture of substandard steel. First, strengthen DTI audit process for local manufacturer of steel, steel products. A surprise audit for local manufacturer whose mark or found on substandard products should include a third-party industry expert. We propose a stricter PS licensing procedure. Third, we propose to delist all inactive PS licenses which are still in the website today. Fourth, the closure of PS license violators. This was done in 1998 by Josic Ernie Ordonez. He has closed down seven um, offending manufacturers and it really stopped the production of these products. Fifth, Amend 71 also to add manufacture of substandard steel products to be covered by penalty in Section 10, similar to smuggling of steel. Now let me go to the remedy for the imported substandard steel. First, we want we propose to strictly enforce DTI DAO 5 on the release of steel products with mandatory standards. Importers shall apply for import community clearance before the arrival of the shipment. BOC shall not release any shipment that does not have prior application for ICC. BOC needs, needs to authenticate with BPS all documents related to ICC. Fourth, there should be transparency in the issuance of ICC for steel products and update Section 10 of 7103 for smuggling. Now let me go to the rampant smuggling of steel. What is the nature? This is undervaluation, underdeclaration, misdeclaration, via traditional smuggling, and via door-to-door -door smuggling. The reason is the avoidance of duties and taxes. Another reason is the oversupply of steel in China, which is estimated to be 200 million tons, and the peculiar tax policy which grants export subsidies to the exporting companies. 
Now, what is the difference between traditional smuggling and door-to-door? -door? Traditional smuggling owns a manufacturing plant and they deliberately import under value and misdeclared their imports. Door-to-door -door smuggling is covered in the next slide. This is in containers. And this is a new anomaly because steel should not be in containers. As you can see in this picture, this steel was already packed and yet it is placed in a steel container, which is quite absurd. Here, it's the customs inspecting the imports of Thunderbird trading, or Copperfield marketing, which displays 26 containers of hot rolled coil when actual content was aluminum zinc coated coils. Now, why do we say it's, uh, there is rampant smuggling of steel? This is data between the China export and the Philippine import. Ten days ago, we had a conference in China together with the ASEAN steel manufacturers, and we got this data from China themselves. So it shows that the Philippines only, and China record differs by around 450,000 metric tons on different steel products like coated sheets, rebar, sections, and pipes. Another proof of the rampant sub, uh, substandard smuggled steel is the case of angle bars by uh, my friend here, Ramon. DTI monitoring enforcement from 2009 to 2013 shows that 48% have substandard steel angles. In test bias operations from 2011 to 2014, 45% were found to have substandard steel angles. Recently, BOC successfully ceased eight shipments containing 46 containers of mediscrate steel angles, totaling 1,150 metric tons. Based on BOC online import data, there was over 11,000 metric tons of similarly declared shipment in 2014. And adjusting for under declaration, the total volume is close to 15,000 tons. Remedy to smuggled steel products. Strictly enforce ICC procedures under DTI DAO 5. Institute pre-shipment inspection for containerized mandatory steel products. This uh, measure is being implemented by Indonesia and it has stopped, totally stopped the substandard products in the market. Update section 10 of RC 2103 relative to prosecution of steel angles, steel smugglers. Allow industry experts to assess in inspecting shipments and prevent bypass of experts. Fifth, strengthen important accreditation process. And six is to analyze import data to detect potential smugglers as steel is just a commodity and is published uh, in several publications with reference pricing. Compute the dollar per metric ton and compare the reference price. Compute the metric ton per container from vessel storage plan. Identify door-to-door -door operators. Many shipments, often small. Many tariff headings across sections. So that's uh, the end of my presentation, Your Honor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kola. Um, in fairness, 10 minutes ngayon. <laughs> Very good. I have a few questions so before we go to customs. Uh. So you had a few figures there. No? One, one troubling one was... Um, uh, regarding the number of outlets that are selling substandard angle, is it called angle angle bars? Yeah. Angle bars, no? The number yeah. that you had there was 48%, so one out of every two. These are hardware stores. You, when you say outlets, do you mean hardware stores? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Tan, would you want to comment? Yes, sir, on that? that's right. Do you want to comment on that? So <coughs> is, is it that prolific, the substandard uh, yes. angle bars in the market? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it's still growing. The number is still growing right now. It's not uh, only 48 in reality, but it's more. It's if, more. It's more. Okay. If we go to the provinces that we don't uh, cover, mm -hmm. it's more. I, if you, okay, pagpunta nyo sa hardware store, uh, nakalagay yan sa isang corner, di ba? Yes, sir. Honor. So, ano yan, nakahalo yung mga substandard dun sa tamang standard or... Uh, can you already identify based on the price? Or um, how is it in, in actual practice? No? Paano ho nyo nakikita? Or talagang di mo na malalaman unless itimbangin mo yung angle bar? The practice of the hardware usually has uh, tatanungin nila kung anong gusto mo, mura o standard. So they have uh, the customer or the consumer has a choice. Tatanungin nila gusto mo mura o gusto mo ng standard. Siyempre murang... Siyempre mura, mm -hmm. correct. So... Yung mura, ibibigay nila substandard. Yung substandard, nakalagay sa ibang lalagyan. Okay, nasa likod. Sa, nasa likod. Ganyan. Sa store mm -hmm. stocks, yung mga display area nila, it's more on uh, legal, legal or standard. So even uh, if DTI were to check, the substandard materials are 
hidden out of sight, basically. Correct. Correct, Your okay. Honor. But in that case, uh, the buyers knowingly uh, buy the cheaper products. Yun po ang nangyayari. <laughs> okay. Are there cases where uh, it's passed off as a standard um, a standard uh, or comply may compliance po yung mga produkto? Yes. Uh, sometimes they pass the uh, substandard for the standard or for the certified. Mm -hmm. Pinapalitan lang nila yung color marking. They uh, up, uh, upgrade the sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes from 316 to 1 fourth, they, they, they just change the color. Okay. Color marking on the bars. The color marking, hindi ho yun, is that a specialized sticker? or no, uh, It is a colored on both sides of the angle bar okay. to so specify the thickness. Palitan madali hong palitan Madali palitan po yun. Wala kang special uh, paint, sticker, special wala paint, wala Paint rin. lang po. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in the case of the angle bar, I'm, uh, Mr. Tan, are you an engineer? Yes, sir. Okay. In the case of angle bars, if, if I am buying the substandard angle bar, Ano po yung magiging epekto nun dun sa gusali o dun sa bahay na ginamitan ko nung substandard angle bars? Uh, <clears throat> structurally speaking, uh, it will, uh, it's, it, it's a big difference using substandard because angle bars are, are considered as a uh, prime structural material. Yan po yung uh, kailangan po pumasa sila sa mechanical test and uh, chemical test, uh, uh, tensile yield strength and elongation. So kailangan mamit nila yung standard na yan to be a uh, cold uh, standard. And uh, magkano po yung price difference nung sinasabi nating mura versus standard? Sometimes sometimes it goes up to uh, 20 to 30% okay. cheaper. Okay. You had another figure there Mr. Cola um, regarding the use of wire rods. Okay, so hindi na to angle, no? These are already the rebars, di ba? Tama, di ba? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So yung, yung material na dapat pang wire, mm -hmm. alambre, basically, right? Uh, ginagamit yon for the rebars. So obviously, yes, yes, because mm -hmm. iba dapat yung usage nun, substandard yung uh, rebars na yon. That's created from this material. Yes, sir. Uh, and is it right? You had a figure there mm -hmm. that there are 60,000 houses now. Mm -hmm. Your estimate is 60,000 houses which are which have used the substandard materials are, and are in danger of uh, being structurally um, are, are structurally dangerous, basically. Yes, sir. That's our derived figure using uh, the 300,000 tons uh, imported wires converted to rebars. 60,000 houses? Yes, yes. So Assuming times five, that's 300,000 Filipinos' lives are at risk because of substandard materials. Yes, yes, yes. And oh. bars pa lang to. Oh. Iba pa yung angles, iba pa yung ibang mga materials. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a stupid question uh, to our engineers here. Kung nagamitan ko yung bahay ko ng substandard material, can I still check? Or wala na? Hindi mo na macha-check yun? Uh, ma macha-check po. Uh, meron kasing logo marking. No, the, pag nagamit na. Uh, you have to... Traceable, traceable, pwede ho matitrace yun kasi may logo marking ho yung bars. Uh, you can see the uh, every one meter, there are, there are mark from the local manufacturer okay. and the grade. But if it's already in the wall, Pwede. kailangan mong bakbakin uh, yung... For, for the reinforcement bar, tama po, kailangan bakbakin. For the angle bar, which is exposed in the roof, uh -huh. you can still check it. I see. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. So for our countrymen who, who might be listening or who, who will read about this, kung mura, masyadong mura yung pagbili nila, that's already a signal na posibleng substandard yon. They can check the angle bars in the roofs, but for the walls, unfortunately, kailangan talaga makita yung mga yung mga bars, no? Because 60,000 houses is na is no joke. That's 300,000 lives that we're talking about. Uh, Mr. Cola, are these all over the Philippines or concentrated in regions of the Philippines? I think this is all over the Philippines, Your Honor. This is a difficult problem because uh it's tantamount to see, fake ray bars. It's fake. Mm -hmm. you, on the surface, you see it's good, but then, uh, as they say, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, that's the, <laughs> the test will be when there's an earthquake. Then uh, that's it. And then, it's very uh, unfortunate uh, that it's happening. Then let me ask si Yusek Cordero here. No? Um, 
in your um, you know having seen the disaster hit areas and doing your work there um, were you able to check I mean nakita ba ninyo na on the aftermath that uh, the substandard still really affected the houses and the buildings in in the typhoon hit areas Mr. Chair, after visiting some of the typhoon-affected areas of Yolanda, the 171 municipalities and cities, we have realized and saw for our station and there are several factors uh, affecting it. And uh, one of the factors that you have pointed out is uh, the substandard steel bars. And we agree the need also to make sure that uh, this can be stopped so that we can prevent further disasters in the future. So it, it's, not an, it's not an exaggeration no, when we say that uh, takamamatay talaga ang substandard steel. It's not, Mr. Chair. Okay. Sige. Let's go to uh, Mr. Tolentino. No? Mr. Tolentino, maybe you can also address some of the concerns of Mr. Cola in his presentation regarding um, stricter measures in terms of importation. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. Mr. Chairman. Uh, our presentation will cover the cargo clearance procedure. Importation data on steel pro products covering January 2013 to March 2014, and list of cases filed since uh, mid-2010 to present. The presentation will be given by uh, my colleagues here, uh, special submits a manifest through the VASP or the value-added service provider and into readable and standard format or ASICUDA, manifest and uh, declarations then submitted to BOC are initially screened and then paid to debiting bank of his choice, uh, the computed uh, duties and taxes and other fees through authorized agent banks. The bank will then transmit a notice to the Bureau through the BOC bank release system advising the importer to his VASP that the clearance for release of the shipment is already granted. This is the electronic to module custom system, CE custom system, and the entry, entry, entry processing unit under the formal entry division. Uh, Doon po nag-check ng completeness and authenticity of the informal entry and IRD and supporting documents uh, packing list. You can see if there is any. And it will be reviewed and uh, in case of disapproval, the head elevates the matter for VCRC for formal deliberation. In case of shipments are subject to clearance from other offices like OCON, District Collector, and other government agencies, the examiner coordinates it with representative of the said agencies. For Super Green Lane entries, shipments or importers accredited under Super Green Lane or Super Green, Green Lane Plus electronic lodgement is made on their offices, pay duties and taxes, Arrest and wife juice for the release of the goods. Uh, this uh, slide shows you how much are importers paying for steel. These are six broad types of iron and steel imports under HS code 7207, 7209. 7 to 11, 7 to 12, 13, and 14, contribute around 50, 56% of the total value of iron and steel imported in 2013. The top 10 importers were per type of iron and steel are picked based on, the, however, this list are sorted by how much they are paid per kilogram of the product. This is uh, readily available sa website po ng Bureau of Customs, so we can check it there. Uh, these are uh, importation data on steel products covering January 2013 up to March of this year. So, ganun din po, naka, naka separate po siya sa six broad types. Uh, ito po yung pie chart. Yung volume po, uh, yung 44%, ganun po sa flat road products of iron or non alloy steel of wood. 600 millimeter or more cold rolled or cold reduced, not clad or plated or coated. Uh, the 36 percent came from galvanized steel sheets and GI sheets, and uh, the green the nine percent is from steel structures, hardware items such as hose, 
bottle stone, angular bars, steel stand, and etc. And another 9% came from pipings or hydrocarbons. Ah, pi pi pipings, carbon steel welded pipes, and steel pipes, and others. Uh, the payment of costumes, duties, and taxes, 36% uh, uh, importers of electrolytic tin plates, galvanized steel sheets, and GI sheets uh, get the bigger amount of uh, payment, uh, pays 36% uh, of the total costumes, duties, and taxes during those uh, over the 2013 to 2014. These are the list of run after the smugglers' cases filed since mid-2010 up to present. Uh, we have nine cases filed. The last of which is the, the one, the Copperfield Marketing, yung na ipakita kanina, where hearing of the case has yet, has yet to be commenced. The basis for recommendation for the seizure of the above-mentioned articles of steel were, was anchored on the misdeclaration or misdescription, misdescription of the said commodities to hide the true contents made intently to evade the, shipment, the payment of the rightful duties and taxes during the said shipments. It will be noted, however, that the enforcement group gets hold of import documents being processed only when an alert order was issued thereon. Unless a payment, a shipment is alerted, we are not privy of the documents in possession of the consignee or the broker. The assessment procedure should not continue unless all the required certifications and permits from the competent authorities are presented, which shall form part of the import documents. Oh, tama, tama. So. I was just about to ask you to wrap up. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, what may I know his name again? Lieutenant Gonda, Your Honor. Gonda? Gonda. Gonda. Yes. Thank you, Lieutenant Gonda. Will Lieutenant Gonda be answering or will Mr. Tolentina be answering the questions? Um, also with me, uh, uh, Attorney Meronilia, mm -hmm. uh, one of our resource person. Pe is that uh, Peronilia? Maronilia. 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 Yeah. Okay. First question, can we go back to the slide on the cases filed? Well, napansin ko lang, no? None of these cases have actually led to a conviction. This is three years ago, four years ago na to. Parang wala pa ako nakita dun sa status na conviction. So, is that, what's the legal team doing of uh, BOC regarding these cases? Sir, the, the run after the smugglers group under the revenue collection and monitoring group actually handles, handles the RATS program. Um, so they're constantly coordinating with the Department of Justice. Um, it's just that with this particular um, case, sir, if um, there are voluminous documents being considered by the DOJ, um, we've already talked to um, Undersecretary um, Toti Baraan, um, I think just two weeks ago, together with Secretary De Lima on how to find ways to actually speed up not just these cases, but a lot of the cases that were filed during 2010. There were cases already elevated before the courts. Unfortunately for this um, particular set of cases, or um, as you may see, there's all of which are still pending preliminary investigation before the Department of Justice. Okay, so from 2010 until now, we've filed nine cases. Most of them are still under review. So, wala pa yung warrant of arrest, wala pang, wala pang na arresto ni Numan. Wala pa po, sir. It's still pending with uh, the Department of Justice. Are these companies blacklisted? Yes, sir. Um, these companies have already been, the accreditation of these companies have already been suspended by the Bureau of Customs. Okay. But if they change their names, nakakalusot ba sila? Or do you check the incorporators, the people behind them? Um, sir, under the particular um, scheme that is being employed now by the Bureau of Customs, all importers will now have to secure um, a import clearance certificate from the Bureau of Internal Revenue. So it's a, it's a two-way process now. The initial vetting will be um, the Bureau of Internal Revenue to really to have to provide a stricter guideline on the, um, the documents that these particular importers are submitting. Um, so part of the process is also a verification check on their tax compliance because one of the 
one of the indicators, sir, that a, an importer is a fly-by-night is usually they don't pay any duty, any taxes to our government. Um, th so, these are just uh, dummy corporations, sir. So that, mm -hmm. so that, that, that was one of our solutions. And then the second vetting, sir, there's still going to be a process by the by the Bureau of Customs after we've received the import uh, the import uh, clearance certificate from the BIR. When did that uh, system start? So it, it's a, the department order was issued by the Department of Finance February, um, oh. March of this year, sir. Okay. March 1, we're already implementing it. And all importers are given until March, uh, May 31 of this year to provide us with the import um, clearance certificate from okay. the BIR. Otherwise, their, their accreditation will be terminated by the Bureau okay. of Customs. So you're saying that um, with this new process where BIR also checks their taxes paid in previous years, you should be able to vet already who are legitimate and who are not legitimate. Tama ba yun? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So if we have a follow-up hearing to this maybe in six months, uh, you can present uh, if that system worked or not. Yes, sir. We will be able to have that data already. Okay. Was that system created in consultation with the industry members or industry associations? Um, there were meetings conducted by the Commissioner of Customs, sir, but um, my impression is initially this was created um, by, BIR. by BIR in coordination only with BIR and the Department of Finance okay. by the Bureau of Customs. Okay. Let me ask uh, our industry association uh, representatives, do you think that this uh, check will be a good check? Aside from that, alam ko rin si Commissioner Sevilla has been posting on the internet uh, everything that comes in, di ba? Uh, was that after a month he'll be posting everything or is it real time? Uh, after, a month. Or no. after a month, no. And that also started just this year, right? Yes. Okay, so that addresses at least two of your concerns, no, Mr. Cola, initially. Uh, if I remember, one concern was uh, transparency in terms of the uh, importers and their products that they're bringing in. So currently, if I'm not mistaken, after one month, you can actually check already uh, and compare that vis-a-vis -vis the market data. Second is um, this double vetting with BIR, no? Also, sir, there's a third one. Um, we've issued uh, a reiteration. There's an old customs memorandum order requiring each and every importer to actually specifically describe their goods. Okay. Um, but this has not been practiced for the longest time. So we've issued um, a memorandum reiterating this. And those who have not complied, if um, you check in the newspapers, we've actually suspended around 70 importers and another 45 brokers for non-compliance of this particular customs memorandum order. Right. Attorney, I have a question. No? Kunyari, um, dineclare ko, um, ano ba usually, uh, wire, wire, no? Or wire rod. And then, pagating dito na check, rebar yon. I'm already liable, di ba? So, bakit taon-taon yung mga kaso? Kung that's already in, in flagrante delicto na yon, di ba? I mean, Iba yung papeles, iba yung dineclare, nung nahuli, iba. Uh, bakit ang tagal na mga kaso kung ganun? Um, sir, kasi may, may, Your Honor, may, there, there are some legal issues confronting um, um, these particular cases. Eh. Um, some of which we, we try to not only, some of which, sir, that's why they, they, kept, they keep on doing this because um, the cases we actually filed before the, the DOJ, when you look at it, these are cases against um, importers which are bogus. So if you run, if you, the, we've experienced cases, we filed cases wherein the, the personality that was actually accredited by the, by the Bureau is not an actual person. Mm -hmm. uh, a, picture, the, the picture, a picture appeared, a combination of names were, were, were given, but the actual person does not really exist. Okay. So let me go to the next question. So once you found smuggled, misdeclared, or Technical smuggling, yun, diba? so smuggled goods. What do you do with it? We seize it, sir, and uh, subject the same to to auction procedures. But if if they cannot be subject to auction procedures because under our particular laws, this cannot be um, released to for for commercial purposes, then we do a rendering or or uh, destruction of the goods. In the case of these materials, what's done? Uh, we we usually sir conduct consultations with the Department of Trade and Industry on, on to the best way on how to dispose of these goods because um, we are of the position that we are not experts as to as to the manner of the disposal of these goods and what potential use they may still have. Um, if we are advised that these goods cannot be cannot be um, released commercially, so we cannot 
conduct um, auction procedures. Um, then we we consult as to how they are going to be rendered, the best way they are going to be rendered. Then we do have um, some third party um, companies that actually does that for us. Okay, um, I think that's your cue, Yusek de Magiba. What, what what do you do with the confiscated materials? Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, it, it can be returned to the point of origin. That's the most cheapest for government. If not, then uh, the industry is willing to cut it into pieces and then it will be sold in auction as scrap metal. So, okay, can you explain? Yung return ho to the point of origin, who pays for that? Well, uh, assuming the importer is not fictitious, the importer. If it is fictitious, I guess the other option is to cut it out and sell it as scrap. Okay. If the importer sends it back, but he still or she is still liable, no? For of course, the he has violated case. the law already. Yeah. Okay. So they have to shoulder the cost of bringing it back to the point of origin. The cost and also expenses and, and litigations for the account. Then there's a fine fines, also, yeah. right? Niba mas advantageous if it's uh, sold to the market. Isn't that a bigger um, a bigger share for the Philippine government? Uh, it's a question now of logistics, how ready industry are in terms of cutting it into pieces. Sometimes there are 20, 30 containers. It's a tremendous number, volume. So we may be confronted with problem of space, things like that. But in some cases, it happened, you know. Okay. It cut it out and then it sold it to scrap. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ku, were you raising your hand? No? Okay. Well, one concern that uh, the industry associations raised is that um, they're afraid that this eventually gets back to the market. So we need to make sure that uh, all confiscated materials are um, accounted for and the speedy disposition if it's going to be scrapped or sent back. No? Do you have a timeline? Uh, I don't know if Mr. Tolentino wants to answer. Do you have a timeline from confiscation to a decision whether this will be scrapped or this will be sent back? Actually, uh, Your Honor, uh, we have no timeline, but uh, we want this to be uh, immediate. Uh, but uh, the problem is that... Uh, uh, there should be a, we should follow a process, court process, and uh, that will take time. However, uh, those confiscated uh, stills uh, are being kept by the auctions uh, unit of the Bureau of Customs. Okay. The committee would like to uh, see a copy of um, the materials which have been confiscated. Because uh, with DTI, you know, we plan to do some checks also on uh, the warehouses as well as the process by which this is disposed of. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the industry would prefer that uh, it's cut up and then sold as scrap, which will be melted again. No, um, But at least we make sure that the substandard materials are not brought back to the market. So could we provide that, Mr. Tolentino, to the committee? Yes, sir. Sure. We will provide the uh a copy of a list of all confiscated items. Okay, and then uh, we can facilitate maybe a trade check with um, Yusek Di Magiba or Secretary Domingo to make sure that these uh, substandard products are not brought back to the market. We'll do that, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, do you have an estimate on um, how much... Uh, kasi ito po yung mga nahuhuli ninyo. Diba? But would you have an estimate dun sa hindi nyo na nahuhuli? Yung mga smuggled in without uh, any paperwork? Would you have an industry estimate? For, for rice, may mga estimates, diba? For, for steel, mayroon ba kayong estimate? We don't have your honor. Can I, let me ask the industry associations. Ha? Yung, uh, ilang, would you have an estimate in terms of uh, what tonnage actually enters the market, which is substandard? In terms, did you have that number earlier, Mr. Cola? What, yes, what sir. was that number? Yeah, it's 450,000, 453,000 tons. 450,000 tons. Uh, of different products, Your Honor. Okay. And to ship 450,000 tons, ilang, how many, can you contextualize that? How many boats are we talking about? How many containers are we talking about? Gano po karami ang, this is per year, no? Or in the market? This, that was last year, Your Honor. Just 2013 figure. Yes, so, dumadagdag pa dyan yung previous year's figures, no? So, let's say 450,000 tons. Can you contextualize that? Ilang barko po yan? Ilang container yan? Gano kabigat yan? Well, gano kabigat is 450,000 tons, but gano ka massive yung pinag-uusapan natin? 
one container will be about 25 tons. So if you divide 450,000 by 25, that's a lot of containers. <laughs> Let's compute it. 450,000 divided by 25. 25, 25 yes, sir. Is 18,000 containers or, or boats? If, if it is containerized. And it's mostly containerized. How many containers in one ship usually? 5,000 containers. 5,000 containers? So, gano'n ho ang capacity ng mga boats natin? Hundreds of thousands of tons yung kaya niya? No, that's for imported production. No? For imported production. Yeah, so, so let's say 1, a boat. Mm -hmm. Yung usual ships natin, mm -hmm. ilang tons yung kaya nun? Usually, the, would BOC know the figures there? In imports. imports. The imported. Actually, sir, uh, what we have here is a uh, volume of... Uh, Imported steel products. Okay, legally. In, in kilograms, legally. Legally, uh -huh. It's uh, 2,240,000, uh, 240 million, 970,771. 240 million ang legally imported? 2,240,000,000. 2 billion tons ang yes. na-import natin? Kilograms. Kilograms, Your yeah. Honor. Uh, sorry. sorry. Kilograms. 2 billion kilograms. Yes. Yeah, no. Ilang tons yun? So divided by 1,000. Tama ba? 1,000 kilograms is 1 ton. To our engineers here, no? Tama ko, di ba? 1,000 kilograms is 1 ton. So 2 billion divided by 1,000 is mga 2 million tons. One, one. Kung 2 billion kilograms, that's 2 million tons. Di ba? So 2 million tons ang imported legally Almost 25% kung 450,000 tons ang illegally imported. So 25% of the market nga yung, yung uh, illegally shipped. Would you have information sa steel associations natin regarding what ports are used to, to smuggle in these products? Or are we talking about a nationwide operation? Uh, the ports you are watching is Port of Manila, Port of Cebu, Davao, and Batangas. And we have... Our enforcement personnel is stationed in these ports, diba? ba? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, are you working with the uh, industry associations and DTI to... We are closely coordinated with uh, uh, the Office of USEC di Magiba for mm -hmm. the permits. Uh, lately, may nagkaroon po kami ng sit-down meeting together with DEPCOM and DEPCOM Nepomuceno and Director Tolentino to... To, ano, to address the, the clearances, sir, para ma, maibigay prior sa shipment. Okay. So, m Mr. Gonda, no? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Gonda, you had that meeting. May mga changes na sa BOC in terms of the systems. Um, the 1 million peso question is, will this be, is, is our situation for steel smuggling improving or is it worsening? The, the importation is a uh, is uh, picking up, but uh, the... No, our fight against smuggling, no? the, the smuggled goods, is it improving or yes, is it worse? Yes, Your Honor, yes, Your Honor. Okay, so when we have a follow-up meeting, a follow-up hearing six months from now, we trust that uh, mas mababa na sa 450,000 tons per year yung report ninyo or report ng associations. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Do you want to say something? On that, uh, nowadays, uh, the Bureau of Customs also write DPI for uh, validation certification on uh, alert alert importation that they doubt uh, whether they comply with DTI. It has never been done before. Could you, yeah. could you explain that to you, second? again? Uh, the, particularly the offices of Deputy Commissioner Napumiseno, Edith Tan, would write DTI and, and certain importation and would verify with us whether uh, the necessary import commodity clearance application had been submitted uh, conditional release had been issued, and uh, you know earlier somebody said that could there can also be bogus uh, import permit issued by DTI. So we we like that scheme because we sat down with them and uh, they are now doing this. It's not in the rules, you know, for them to ask me, but they're doing it as an additional precaution for questionable importation. Yeah. So again, on that note, um, you said, Baka, you would like to start with your with your presentation? Uh, most of my <laughs> materials have been uh, touched by uh, Mr. Kola and uh, BOC. So can I jump to slide number nine?
Okay, just to put in context with the chairman, that uh, the product certification scheme of the Department of Trade Industry would cover three groups of products. Uh, mechanical, building, and construction, the one we're talking today on steel products. But we also have a conformity certification for electrical and electronics and chemical and consumer food. And uh, you will see on this slide the total product standard licenses that have been issued uh, as of today, December 2013. Uh, this, the PS mark are for locally manufactured products. The next slide would show to you the total number of imported products covered by certification, uh, the total number of import commodity clearance certificates. Uh, uh, this is the licensing system that uh, the first defense for imported items. Uh, next slide would just show to you the marking or the labeling that had to be, uh, that a consumer should check uh, for locally product and also for imported products, the PS mark and the ICC mark. The ICC mark, the PS mark is embedded, embossed, or curved, but the ICC is a sticker, the chairman, that is uh, pasted on the box or the container of the product. For steel products, uh, since we do not use ICC sticker for steel products, uh, we approve, Mr. Chairman, what we call a logo. It's a distinguishing mark that identifies ownership of a product to a particular company. So now, next slide. Can you jump on the, just for the information of the committee, on the different regulated steel products? All right and the equivalent uh, Philippine national standards. We are talking here of uh, first uh, steel, black, and hot deep zinc coated uh, galvanized longitudinal welded steel pipes. The next one are re-rolled steel bars for concrete reinforcement. Third one are steel bars for concrete reinforcement also, with otherwise known as deformed steel bars. And then the galvanized steel sheets and coils, hot deep metallic sheet, huge sheets for roofing. The next are steel wire nails or common nails and finishing nails. The sixth one are hot rolled steel sections or hot rolled equal leg steel angle bars. And the seventh is steel wires. On the wire rod, Mr. Chairman, uh, we don't have a Philippine national standards specification for that material. So. Having heard the report of the industry on YRAD, uh, maybe the DTI can study uh, whether standards can be imposed on importation of YRADs. Not covered by the regulated steel products, Mr. Chairman, are square steel bars and billets. Billets are actually the raw materials and are not being required to be certified. Finished product determines compliance to standards. The next two slides are just definition of terms. Uh, can we also share with the committee what DTI had done in terms of enforcement and monitoring at the retail level? And uh, we'll focus on uh, the achievement of DTI during the Aquino administration. Uh, so the first slide would be uh, uh, enforcement monitoring conducted by Region 3 in January 2011, October 2012, and first quarter 2013. A total of 40,728 pieces of non-conforming steel were confiscated, and a total of 700,000 pesos administrative fines was imposed. All the apprehended establishment were issued formal charges, and all consumer complaints were acted upon. Out of 32 apprehended establishment, 31 have been dissolved, and one is on pending appeal. As to your question, what we do with confiscated steel products, they are also cut into pieces and sold at auction. Uh, the second is the effort of our Region 4A in uh, Batangas and Cavite in April 2012. Total of eight establishments were monitored selling uncertified steel products. Uh, incidentally, to your question earlier to the Equal Leg Angle Bar Association, uh, uh, the first frontline notice to the consumer in checking and buying is to look for the markings. 
because this consumer would don't would don't have the technical expertise to weigh it you know so kung wala hong markings yun yung tinatawag naming uncertified or unmarked doon pa lang wag nang bilhin kaagad no now if he demands that a steel product be weigh then kailangan yung hardware meron siyang pansukat at saka may timbangan siya so in this case, uh, a total of each establishment destroyed and cut is a total of 1,644 angle bars, and J pipes worth 2,492,000 pesos, and administrative fines of 817,000 pesos. The chairman, uh, we don't file criminal cases yet, uh, but uh, we will uh, report. Well, I can report now that uh, the Department of Justice had. Uh, created a task force of prosecutors to help the DTI in building up cases because uh, we agreed in DTI now that in addition to filing administrative cases, we can also start filing criminal cases on the result of our enforcement and monitoring at the retail level. So a group of 10 prosecutors have been designated by Secretary de Lima for the purpose, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next slide is the highlight of monitoring enforcement in Laguna in 2011-2012. 14 establishment confiscated 6,499 pieces of steel products and 595,000 administrative fines. Next slide, please. Uh, just this year, March 4 to 7, 2014, and March 10 to 12, 2014, in Caloacan, Maloban, we confiscated a total of 1,720 pieces of steel products for product standard violation. All of these are undergoing uh, product testing for confirmation that they in fact do not meet the requirements of the applicable standards. And then assuming all documents are complete, formal charges will be appropriately filed. Uh, we have filed formal charges to one establishment and a notice of violation uh, in the national capital region. Uh, Shokos letters were issued to them. Another report for this year is the enforcement and monitoring in Caloocan in January 8, 2014. A total of 10,000 pieces of uncertified and substandard steel bars worth 700,000 pesos were confiscated. In this particular case, uh, seven manufacturers and five tra traders were formally charged. Uh, uh, I want to highlight, Mr. Chairman, when we say seven manufacturers, these are actually PS licensee holders. The traders are normally the hardware stores. Okay. And uh, next slide. Uh, sometime last year, a search warrant was issued and confiscated 300 tons of uncertified black iron and galvanized iron pipes, or BIGI. <laughs> I noticed, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, the association of the black iron, organized iron sheets, uh, uh, is one of those uh, associations that we work with uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, collaboration in this area. And for ongoing administrative cases against the establishment for violation of the Consumer Act and the Product Standards Law is ongoing at the DTI. On the initiatives, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we now have a new bureau in the Consumer Protection Group called the Fair Trade Enforcement Bureau that will now centralize and nationalize enforcement and monitoring compliance to standards not only of steel products, but all those products that I mentioned earlier that are covered by mandatory certification, particularly in the national capital region. You know, Mr. Chairman, whatever we put perform, whatever we do is really in NCR. You know, if we don't do our job NCR, I think uh, DTI will fail in its uh, campaign for monitoring enforcement. And of course, I'm happy to report that uh, we have better and closer collaboration with the Bureau of Customs at the moment to ensure that uh, that 25 percent, I guess, I guess P PISI didn't report to us of the 25 percent how much really are imported and how much are locally manufactured. Because we do get uh, reports of uh, non-compliance to standards, even if logo owners. So th that's all my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek Dimagiba. Maybe we can jump off on that question. 
anong percentage? Does PISA have a figure or, or, or Mr. Tanner or Mr. Ko have a figure? What percentage of the substandard is imported and what percentage are made here? I don't have the figure for the local manufacturer, Your Honor, but what I presented is just the figure from China. So you're saying it's even larger? That's right, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Ku, Mr. Tan, would you have any information regarding uh, substandard materials imported versus uh, crafted here? Uh, for the local, for our test buy and uh, market monitoring data, it, it clearly shows that uh, more than 45% are selling substandard hardware store i mean mm -hmm. are selling substandard angle bar uncertified and substandard but uh in our uh, boc side uh, i think ramon ku will uh, report actually your honor uh we would like to uh uh to give uh the praise to bureau of custom because this february or this week this year they have uh they have uh, actually, uh, ceased to contain uh, two uh, broker, uh, importers, Skylink and also the Thunderbirds, Thunderbirds uh, are importing angle bars, and these angle bars are now we are uh, we're a little bit being frightened because they the, these angle bars have logos, which is, which is, from the local manufacturers mm -hmm. and logo nya, pero these are all imported. And we were we were being afraid of this because based on our record, based on the records that the bureau have presented, po, for these past months, they have uh, uh, flushed out around 11,013 uh, metric tons of steel products, and these are generally being uh, tagged as clamps, structural steels, hardware items, bars like that, hinges just the same what they have caught with Skylink and also Thunderbirds. Mm -hmm. And these have been occurring every month. And I have this record that we have uh, filed uh, a complaint or asking how, how are being done for the other importer as well. Okay. So these are, uh, if you want, uh, Your Honor, we would like to pass sure. to you this, re yeah. this record to, to your office. Sure, we can, the committee can accept later that. Paul. So you. basically, Yusek, you're saying there are uh, three, three sets, no? Yung uh, gawa dito na substandard, yung imported na substandard, at yung imported na substandard na may tatak ng mga manufacturers dito. You have three sources basically of uh, substandard steel. At, at the moment, that's what uh, we are uh, discovering in, in, in tightening this uh, issue of substandard and uncertified. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yusek, let me um, jump off also in terms of the monitoring and compliance. No? Um, kung ganyan ho kasi karami yung nagbebenta ng substandard, then we have an industry problem here. No? This, is, this is not a small problem if practically half of the retailers are selling substandard materials. And basically, that's what the industry associations are saying, right? No? Whatever source they come from, half of the hardware stores are actually uh, selling these uh, substandard materials. So my first question is, kung nahuli ka selling substandard materials, uh, what is the penalty? Is, is, is the penalty to the hardware store owner, to the manufacturer? Sino ho yung lumalagot dyan kapag uh, nahulihan ng substandard materials? Uh, first, the hardware. And then, uh, the hardware issued what we call a notice of violation. And then, uh, they are asked to submit from whom they bought the products. Meaning, either another supplier or another distributor. Uh, in some cases, hardware would buy directly from the manufacturer, so the sales invoice. In the 2014 monitoring enforcement that I reported, Mr. Chairman, uh, we also included the manufacturer in the formal charges because uh, their logo appeared to be the identity of the products. But, well, to be fair, Pwedeng pinahiram nila yon or pwedeng ginamit yon without their knowledge? That, that could be. But in addition to the Mr. Chairman, I almost forgot. I, I heard we have a representative from the DOST here. When we confiscate products, we get samples. We, we, we manually test the measurement and the weight at site. Yeah. 
But after that, we get samples and submit it to the laboratory for the final confirmatory. So the two reports should jive, whether it's underweight or kulang uh, sasuka to haba. So, and that the only point that uh, we will make a determination whether we'll file a case or not. On whether ginamit lang or what, I think, uh, we, I cannot comment on that because it uh, could be sub judicial because some could be an answer, you know, thank you. Uh, but going back to the penalty, no? for the hardware store, it's just a fine. But you were saying earlier that you might actually file a criminal case against them as well. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, because uh, uh, this has been uh, hotly discussed during the management planning of DTI, how we tighten enforcement monitoring. I guess people can really afford to pay the fines. It, uh, under our present law, now, Mr. Chairman, for product standard violation, the maximum is still at 150,000 pesos. Mm -hmm. I think that's one area maybe we can... Per bar yun, di ba? Uh, that's per bar. Per, per, no, no not, not per bar. That's per instance. Per, per instance, meaning... It should be per bar, actually, yeah. no? Yeah. Di ba? Yeah. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, although you read the law, you read the Consumer Act, really the product standard law, there is an criminal penalties. That's why it was discussed in the management committee, and we agreed, in fact, part of our governance scorecard commitment now is at least file criminal cases. And that's the reason why we have to work with the Department of Justice on this. I, I should have invited them as well. Yusek, what, um, what determines whether it remains administrative or it goes up to criminal? Actually, uh, none. In fact, uh, both remedies, if you will read the law, both remedies should have been done even in the past. Okay. So let this serve as a warning to half of the hardware stores out there. No? Na DTI is going to go heavy on this, not just an administrative fine, but also in terms of criminal cases. But you said you should also take a look at the law because fines are based on per violation. So if uh, it only takes one false rebar or one false uh, angle bar, to have a fine of 150,000, it might mean that each one is a is a, is is a fineable, no? Technically speaking, you can take a look at that. Uh, we, will, we will check on, on uh, your point. In, in other cases, because it's usually per item, no? Uh, you can take a look at that so that at least the fines can be more substantial. Um, my other point I would like to raise is, um, you know, they have data. They've actually done uh, store checks already. Have you submitted those stores which are selling substandard uh, materials to DTI so they can actually monitor so they don't have to do spot checks anymore, no? Milistan, you've done, they've done the initial investigation for you, no? So have you forwarded that uh, information to DTI? Uh, not yet, not yet, Your Honor. But okay. uh, from time to time, we are uh, informing the DTI regarding our activities on, on our test buy because... Uh, we, we also file our verified complaint. So, but in totality, they don't have our data, the summary of our test buy. Okay, we're going to, at the end of this um, hearing, we're going to call for a TWG. And in that technical working group, maybe we can all come together with our data and, and, and try to see how we can make this work, no? Um, because I also intend to probably call a hearing six to eight months from now to check on the market figures. No? Because at the end of the day, lahat ng ginagawa natin, kung wala namang epekto sa merkado, bali, wala. Diba? But I'm, I'm happy to hear that there are these new developments with DTI and new developments with uh, BOC. But again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. No? Kung talagang kumunti yan sa merkado, then, you know, that's when we've known that our efforts are actually leading to something. So, Yusek uh, Dimagi Barang, for the record, if, for example, our industry associations do have a list of uh, hardware stores that are selling substandard materials, nothing is stopping DTI from checking those stores and filing the proper cases, right? Uh, nothing, nothing is wrong with sharing information, but uh, we go to the process, meaning it's DTI who should inspect yes. the retail store and find for itself that they are uncertified in substandard products. Uh, there are very few cases with German that uh, some sharing information from the industry had been used uh, 
and DTR had been caught in the middle. So we are very careful about, about that. Anyway, the mandate is with us. We appreciate the information. We collaborate with them, but we sit down with them, and these are all the source person you invited today are all working with us very closely. But at the end of the day, Mr. Chairman, it's us in DTI who should inspect the retail side because it is our notice violation that is the first stage in piling an administrative case or now a criminal case. Yeah. Thank well, you. I guess you said no, you could consider this a, um, siguro parang a, a, a third party cross reference, diba? Well, first of all, do you agree with their estimation that one out of every two or practically 50% of hardware stores are currently selling substandard materials? Does DTI concur with that estimate? That's one item that we would like to sit down with them, you know. We also would like to get that information. Uh, first time we heard about, we know there are a lot, but uh, the first time I heard about citing a figure is in this meeting today. Okay. So that was out of over 500 outlets, right, Mr. Tan? Y y yes, Your Honor. 527 to be Hardware correct. stores yes, that yes. you checked? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and uh, maybe and just quickly, was that done through a survey or did you have uh, no, uh, this is a secret shoppers no, who went is, in? This is a ma market monitoring conducted uh, jointly by uh, uh, DTI uh, and the Industry Association. Uh, this is from 2009 to 2013 uh, for the span of five years. Uh, we conducted this together with the uh, regional offices of uh, DTI and provincial offices also. Okay, so I guess you, said you can just verify that. No? And if indeed true, that's a terribly high number. That's a disastrously high number kung ganoon po karami yung, um, yung nagbibenta ng substandard materials. No? With regard to the importation, tama ho, no? iba yung issue na nasa, pag nasa merkado na, kayo na yan, di ba? Okay, kung nasa ports pa siya, uh, do, do you have any operations with uh, BOC regarding um, regarding the shipment or, or as long as it hasn't left the port, it's basically under the jurisdiction of customs? It's uh, under the jurisdiction of the customs, but the importer needs to go to us and apply for that import commodity clearance and then we issue a conditional release. Assuming everything is legitimate, they use that the broker use that in filing the import entry and then gets release of the items. Okay. Yeah. So actually, it's not just BIR. It's BIR and DTI and BOC working on uh, trying to vet who are legitimate and who are not legitimate. Yes, sir. That, that's basically the one of the requirements, I think, that the BIR will also require of importers from uh, who claim to import steel products is... Uh, um, papers coming in or documents coming in from from DTI mm -hmm. concerning their business as well as uh, some other documents that will show that indeed they, their primary product of importation are steel products. Okay. So, okay. Let's move now to maybe this is a broader perspective on um, uh, quality, qual the quality infrastructure in the Philippines. So we're going to ask Mr. Juan to uh, share his presentation. Well, I think medyo lumilinaw naman kung ano yung mga kailangan gawin. No? Definitely, I think at the retail side, if we're able to be more strict on the retail side, this will have a big effect because, you know, you just can't sell these materials in grocery stores or, you know, in uh, they have to be sold in hardware stores no, primarily. So working with uh, hardware stores, I think, or getting them to, to um, separate the substandard from the standard, I think, will be uh, very big for the market. No? But I guess the importation is also equally important because... You know, once it's there, it's quite tempting because these are um, cheaper, substandard, and when it gets to the market, the margins are probably going to be higher for the distributor. So um, also confiscating them and um, cutting them up is also equally important. No? So we'll ask Mr. Wan. Um, this is our last presentation. No? So then later on, we'll have the others who haven't spoken if they want to speak. No? So Mr. Wan, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking on a quite a broad topic. Uh, we had uh, initially heard specific uh, numbers and uh, problems with the steel industry, but uh, uh, we could perhaps uh, see a broader uh, opportunity and problems also on different products and materials. Uh, so we take a holistic approach for uh, the improvement of quality. Uh, we are aware of uh, roads, bridges, highways, once they are built 
uh, anybody can use these highways and bridges. Means, uh, it serves many purposes. That is the same as the national quality infrastructure. Once the structure is there, it could serve the food industry, steel industry, and any other industry as well as services. And NQI, or the National Quality Infrastructure, can be applied at the conception of a idea for a product uh, during research, development, as well as production, and during trading. So NQI is not uh, applicable only at the last stage for acceptance testing, but in the very beginning of the development of the product. These are the major components of uh, NQI, standardization, metrology, and accreditation. Standardization means the uniformity, so that uh, uh, one component could be compatible with another one because they conform to the same standards, the same measurements, and so on. And metrology sees to it that uh, accurate measurements are, are done so that indeed this product can be me uh, messed with each other. And accreditation will be a test or evaluation of uh, competence, technical competence of testing laboratories, technical competence of uh, measuring laboratories, as well as various institutions. We could accredit various institutions. Well, let's look at a, uh, when, when you are ordering a ring, you might not want a standard ring. You might opt for a one of the kind a ring. So what other things can we talk about uh, rings on standards? Well, uh, simply, we could have different sizes of rings, and there's an agreement between the buyer and the store for these different sizes. It makes uh, 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 the trade uh, simpler. And also, it uh, results to fewer stocks, like uh, rebars. You have only 10, 12, and so on, not, uh, all, not all the variety of dimension. So by using these standards, we are able to have fewer items. If you have fewer items, you need fewer tools to check those items. And it's easier to manage the inventory, and there's a good uh, communication between buyer and trader. Well, at, yeah. uh, that was an example for the cassette, but we jump to the another example for the Maybe you are familiar with the uh, laptops, uh, cameras, cell phones. There, the, most of them have this USB cable, a standard covering cable, computer, keyboard, mouse, disk drive, memory sticks, and so on and, and so on and so forth. So, with these standards, we are able to have compatibility with the components. We could interchange uh, parts from one manufacturer to another, and there could be efficiency of manufacturing and uh, selling. These are the uh, example of uh, standards for USB, it could uh, there could be USB one, then two, and then three, depending on the speed of the USB. And with by introducing different levels of standards, we are actually encouraging the industry or the company to strive for a higher quality. So it's a voluntary nature that they seeing these uh, different standards, they could say that we have U USB two and we are hoping for USB 3. So there's a, and standards are usually done through participative uh, uh, effort. And for the USB, there are seven major companies uh, doing it in 1994. It covers, as we said before, covers many products. And by many products, it opened a uh, vast opportunity for manufacturers. And companies have a stake on it. These are the different levels of uh, coverage. Uh, by level, company, industry, then you could have national, regional, and international. This covers not only products, but processes, services, institutions. And uh, maybe uh, we could uh, take standards as a voluntary uh, thing. It, it responds to the demands of the market. Uh, Given the different uh, set of standards, the consumer could, could select which of those, A, B, or C. It's up to him it's whether it, A is feature purpose or it should be B. And the standards will contain information allowing the consumers to make an informed decision. 
is knowledge-based decision. Yes. Now, how do we know that uh, USB uh, conforms to USB 2 or USB 1? Same, same, same manner would like to know whether a 10 millimeter reinforcing bar conforms to certain standard PNS. So, so for, uh, for steel, for example, we would have uh, different measurements that be conducted at different fields. Well, let's say for the steel, it will be force or strain or stress. And at all levels of, uh, wait, uh, all levels of uh, uh, accuracy, whether it's being used by the carpenter or the machinist or the space uh, uh, researcher. It covers also theoretical and practical as well. Metrology uh, defines these different units of measurement. We were talking a while ago on so many millimeters as diameter of steel. So we have to have a common understanding of the millimeter or meter. So that's well defined internationally based on physical constants. And not only that, we have to disseminate these uh, units of measurement to the different users and see to it that one kilogram a year is in this country is the same as one kilogram in the other. That is, is done by comparison. Now, within the country, if we know the one kilogram for the country is uh, so much, how do we know that the one being measured in the Palenque and market and uh, industry are the same uh, one kilogram? That is done through calibration of measuring instrument, weighing scales, yardstick, and so on, or meter stick, and so on. And metrology covers also the me measurement techniques, not only instrument, but how to do a correct measurement. Now, if uh, given that the, we could measure the steel bars, now do we do it ourselves? That might be inefficient for us. So we could come up with certification. Somebody might be more capable or has the time or resources to really evaluate compliance of uh, certain products to standards. Normally, uh, the standards making body is a good in a good position to, to do this certification because he's quite knowledgeable on the standards being questioned or, 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 or talk about. So he will evaluate products, processes, as well as management system to have a broader coverage. Now, if a certifying body says that this uh, food or that reinforcing bar conforms to PNS number so-and-so, how can we be sure that that certifying body is correct? or really competent in its job. So we have accreditation. That means the evaluation of technical competence of those bodies that could cover testing laboratory, calibration laboratory. Are they really doing the right thing? Are there people competent and so on? Do you have the proper management system in place and so on? And co accreditation also covers certifying bodies as well as inspection bodies. Uh, Mr. Wan, can we yes. wrap up? You have two minutes. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we could go to technical regulations uh, uh, in contrast to the voluntary standards or the standards. The, these are requirements to assure safety, health, consumer protection, environmental protection, and fair trade. When standards are voluntary, regulators can select appropriate sections of that standard. Not necessarily the whole standard, but they could select, which require compliance to those sections mentioned. Care must be taken that only those sections affecting following are enforced, safety, health, consumers, environmental protection, and fair trade. Example, uh, uh, we, let's say that we have a PNS number so and so, so this is a voluntary standard covering different uh, uh, properties. Then an example will be still reinforcing bars used in concrete structures shall have a tensile strength no lower than those specified in table X, of this standard. So we leave a certain paragraph from that standard. But if the whole standard is enforced, every product covered will have the same features and remain standard. Imagine if we have a standard for this microphone and we are forced or mandated to follow that standard, the microphone will look like straight for, forever. There's no, no improvement. So it's, it will kill innovation. Now in summary, we have here a manufacturing process 
from the product development, manufacturing, and then to the market. So you are familiar that we have to test during product development and, and the manufacturing stage. Eh? Uh, then we have to do measurements, meteorology. We have calibration laboratory, calibrating equipment of the testing laboratory, and the uh, uh, some measuring measuring instrument of the company itself could be brought to the calibration laboratory. So the measurement will be done. Then, there, as mentioned, there is a certification system so that the test could be conducted and based on the results and the uh, inspection of the plant and, then, and its management system. The a certifying body could issue certification to that uh, uh, company and product. And notice this calibration laboratory, testing laboratory, and certifying body must be competent in their services. So accrediting ba accreditation body or accreditation system will sit, will assure us that those three, for example, and many others are doing their job competently. And if you look at the whole situation, everything is covered by standards. Standards for product, standards for the service, calibration laboratory, testing laboratory, certification body, even the accreditation body and the meteorology body conforms to certain standards. These are written documents that are all voluntary. Thank you. Well, um, can we go back to the last slide, Ms. Ampi? Yeah. Okay. So in, in, in this case, I think everyone knows what they're supposed to do and everyone sees where they are you now there. And uh, any time that um, uh, in the manufacturing process or in the accreditation process or the certification process, if there is fraud, obviously we're not following the right standards or the right process and therefore there's a problem and that, ye that uh, yielded this big problem that we have, no? that there is substandard materials in the, in the market. But uh, Mr. Wan, my question for you, which is a very difficult question, I think, uh, what if the market itself does not appreciate standards? Because the case in the hardware stores is that they know that uh, they're buying substandard. No? I mean, of course, there are cases where it's fraudulent, mali yung tatak, or all of these things. But we do have a case, and I'm guessing that's maybe common, that uh, they're offered substandard materials and yet they still choose to buy because of the price. So do you have a comment on uh, how we can also work on the public? No? Because uh, DTI will work on the retailers, BOC will work on the importers, our industry association will hopefully um, look at uh, the application of all of these in the market. Pero yung publico is also a key component here, di ba? How, do we, how are we able to get the message across that they also need to do their share and buy um, the right materials at the price of which it is really in the market. Yes. Uh, the consumer or the buyer should be informed well enough of uh, some standards as well as uh, technical regulations. We, we must give the consumer tools. So, so if the standards and technical regulations are uh, accessible to them, they will know the difference between a one that complies with standard, that will be the properties, and the other one is a, which is uh, a question mark, not unknown. So maybe uh, if they're well educated, they'll have second thoughts. If this is cheap, but this one has this different characteristics, so they might uh, opt to buy this one. But if they don't know the characteristic of the one being regulated, that is the 10 millimeter bar, I, they don't know the properties and so on, what it's what it, is it good for? Mm -hmm. Then they will not really go to the cheaper products. So it needs comp uh, consumer education in these different components. Thank you, Mr. Juan. And uh, I honestly think, no, it's the, unfortunately, it's the burden of the industry to be able to make that known to the public. No? Of course, government will do its share in terms of uh, talking about proper standards. But as we all know, it's really um, the ones controlling the market or the ones who are in the market who are in the best position to publicize and talk about standards. No? Um, so I'm hoping that as we do all of these enforcement mechanisms, um, all of your industry associations, if I'm not mistaken, there's like eight or nine industry associations can really work on the public as well in terms of um, sharing with them what the right standards are and what it means to actually buy substandard materials. No? Because ano eh? uh, 
unfortunately, if everything we do in government really takes some time, no? Even if um uh, Yusik Dimagiba tomorrow visits 200 hardware stores, it will still take some time before um, the market really corrects itself. No? So one way to really go about it is really to spread the word. No? And I'm sure DTI will welcome that, that they uh, spread the word regarding uh, how to check, what stickers to look for, what attack to look for, and be able to really impress upon people that um, they need to buy the right standard materials also. Uh, <clears throat> Angle bars have a uh, buyer's guide, also with the deformed bars. Uh, it states here that how to buy the proper uh, material. It is specified the thickness, the correct weight, the logo marking, and the color marking for the thickness. It also uh, says the local manufacturers that manufactures the uh, our RPS license uh, companies that manufacture the angle bars. Also with the uh, deformed bars, it's the same. They have a buyer's guide. Yes, but we need the materials which are probably more more compelling as well, no? I mean, uh, unfortunately, sir, right now, even if you have those brochures, no, hindi ko alam kung napapansin siya. You need to have a, a real communication campaign to, to drive the point, di ba? And, um, it's far-reaching eh, because, you know, the, the reason why we asked PAR to, to be here is because this really costs lives. No? And uh, I think that's really the main reason why we were so insistent to call this hearing during the session break. Because no? it's really an important issue. Okay, so uh, we're at the tail end of the hearing. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, anyone if, if they would like to uh, talk about other things. Um, so we'll start with Mr. Bernardino from the Tariff Commission. Then we'll have Mr. Arobio from PSA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a clarification or question to the industry. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about wire rods. And some importations were declared as wire rods if, in fact, uh, they go into reverse later on. That, and the good undersecretary also mentioned that there's still no uh, standards on wire rods, finished wire rods. Uh, just a question, what's the definition of wire rods in the industry? Because wire rods are not uh, specifically provided for on the Tariff and Customs Code. Kaya baka naman nilalagay na wire rod eh. Uh, dahil wala doon, ilalagay doon sa hanapan ng mababang duty. Okay? So we wanted uh, the industry to tell us what's the definition of wire rods. Uh, under the Tariff and Customs Code, uh, there is a provision here, it says, Bars and rods hot rolled in irregularly wound coils of iron or non alloy steel. If that is the definition of wire rod, then there is a specific provision for that under the Tariff and Customs Code. There's a clarification here. Who wants to respond? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, wire rod, as it is, uh, is a material that will be used further to produce wires and nails. So what is happening, the wires now are being used to produce reinforcing bars of PNS-49, which is not allowed in the standard. PNS-49 specifies that for rebars, it should come from billets. And this covers rebars from 10 millimeters up to 50 millimeters. Um, Mr. Cole, I think the question of Mr. Bernardino, um, technically, Nagpaso ako ng wire rod. I paid the right duty. Hindi illegal yon. If I make wire, if I make nails, or, or I sell it as wire. Once I make it into rebar, that, that's when it's illegal because no way can that rebar match the standard that is expected in the market, right? Uh, if it is made into PNS 49 rebar, yes sir. Oh, so the penalty is not, kumbaga, even si Customs will not stop that. Diba? Kasi tama declaration niya eh. Diba? It's in the... And manufacturing it, um, Yusek, is also not illegal. It's the selling of it, passing it off as rebar, that's illegal. Yes, that's why local manufacturing can also be, on that end, uh, mm -hmm. be contributing to selling substandard products. Okay, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Senator Smenya. Yeah? Okay, so just to get it correct, no? Papasok yung wire rod, it's declared as wire rod, it's not illegal. Papasok yun sa isang manufacturer, he makes rebars, 
it's still not illegal, right? But when they sell it to the market as a rebar at a certain standard, that's when it becomes illegal. But they're not in violation of smuggling. They're in violation of uh, product standards. So consumer protection law yun, right? That's right, that's right, Mr. Chairman. Correct. Okay. So in short, sir, it's not. I, the tariff that is stated is the tariff that is stated. No? So th we don't have an issue about uh, the current um, duties on wire rods. No, That's not the issue. Do you want to ask uh, something else? Or was that clarified, Mr. Bernardino? Uh, because under that, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the in irregularly wound coils. Are these in coils or not? Okay, I think that's a question. Irregularly wound coils, is that wire, are those wire rods? Yes, they are in coils. Okay. Uh, under that provision, there are two rates, 1% and 7%. If that irregularly wound coil uh, have indentations or groove, which are used for rebars, okay, that is 7%. But if it is uh, in uh, uh, no, no indentations, then it is 1%. So that's... Uh, no, uh, room for smuggling. So we're saying on, uh, it might be misdeclared. It should be at 7, but they're declaring it so that it's at 1%. It's at that already is technical smuggling. Yes. So I'm sure Customs will take a look at that further. No? Okay. Mr. Arobio. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to read the, uh, the position, uh, the statement by the Philippine Steelmakers Association, Your Honor. Uh, the PSA is for consumer welfare and protection and fully, fully supports the drive against substandard steel products, which do not conform to the requirements of duly instituted Philippine product standards. For the longest time, the PSA has been cooperating and coordinating with the DTI and its uh, attached agency, the Bureau of Product Standards, in the conduct of market monitoring and enforcement activities directed at ensuring that Philippine product standards are enforced in the marketplace. The PSA supports the application of well-defined procedures relative to the conduct of market enforcement activities, which have been implemented for many years. Enforcement protocols should be such that constitutionally guaranteed right to due process of all parties concerned must always be respected. This ensures that such enforcement activities are A, not used to harass any manufacturer, importer, or retailer, B, not used as a competitive tool by any party with vested interests, and C, preserved of its credibility at all times. The PSA likewise supports the anti-smuggling drive of government and industry, especially relative to all steel products. For the past many years, the PSA, in coordination with the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Bureau of Customs, has put in place technical personnel called industry commodity experts at the major port facilities in Manila who assist, assist the BOC in tracking steel importations and ensuring proper declaration and valuation. The PSA commits to support other programs that may be put in place intended to curb out any form of smuggling. PSA also supports the fair trade and fair competition in all its forms. PSA urges the uh, passage of antitrust regulations and opposes, the acts, opposes acts that uh, impugn good names of others in order to promote one's self-interest. The PSA urges a review of RA 7103, or the Iron and Steel Industry Act, that was passed almost 23 years ago. With the many changes that the steel industry has undergone over the years, such review is therefore deemed necessary. We at the PSA humbly offer our knowledge, expertise, and experience in addressing the issues raised by PSR 564, and we thank uh, the Honorable Chair and the members of this committee for giving us this opportunity to express our position on this important matter. Thank you, um, Attorney, Attorney Arobio, right? Anto Antonio lang. Antonio, okay. Yes, um, yes definitely we will welcome um, uh, comments on the uh, Steel Industry Act from all of our uh, resource speakers. Um, maybe it is time that we revisit that and see how we can help the industry. The industry was quite different 23 years ago. I think now it's a totally different um, animal already. No? So maybe it is time to update that. Uh, we also give you the opportunity, no? in the same way Mr. Bernardino took the opportunity to ask our industry experts, would you want to ask anything from our um, government uh, institutions here? Or any comments from our industry associations? Or Ngayon na ang panahon, nagkakaharap tayo, and I take it na hindi yun ganun kakomon, no? So, would you have any suggestions or comments, uh, Mr. Arobio? Um, yes, Your Honor. Uh, just one uh, comment. Uh, 
uh, related to the earlier discussions, uh, I think that uh, one uh, simple uh, way of really educating the public uh, with respect to standards uh, pertaining to steel, steel products, particularly steel bars where we are in, uh, is the posting of uh, probably posters in all uh, hardware stores or outlets indicating the logos, the accredited logos, uh, whether imported or local, mm -hmm. so that uh, anybody who goes there, even the store, manu uh, the store owner, would know that somebody selling him uh, some goods uh, which do not bear the logo posted there, Bawal yan. hindi na niya okay. kukunin yun. Yung sikri magiba? Uh, it has been done in the past. Maybe we should revisit that, you know, update the logos. Uh, there are more logos now than maybe four or five years ago. All right. We can do that in partnership with the industry association. Mr. Kola? Uh, it's a question for you, Sikni Magiba. I understand the market monitoring and enforcement is done at the provincial level. So what will be the role of this uh, Fair Trade Enforcement Bureau? Uh, at the National Capital Region, it will be the Fair Trade Enforcement Bureau. In the rest of the country, it's still the provincial offices. So the monitoring that we were talking about and the increased um, compliance measures will be handled by the FTEB and NCR and the regional offices and DTI. That's right, Mr. Chan. And we'll do that in coordination with the with everyone involved. No? Yes, you know. All right, Senator Spena. Yes, just a couple of comments, Mr. Chair. Can we not uh, identify the logos also through the internet? Do you do that? It's uh, uploaded DTI? already in the right. DTI. Now, the DTI, how many inspectors do you have in the regions? I, I know you don't have a very big staff. In Cebu, sometimes you only have something like 17. At and, least. And, and, and you cover a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah. I, we agree on your observation, uh, Mr. Senator. At least we have one per province. At and in the region. But you don't have an office in every province. We do have two. Now? Yes. Maski mga maliliit, like Sikihor and... Except for the two new provinces uh, that was recently created. We have provincial directors in all provinces. Right? Okay. Uh, Sikihor, how many... Anong complement niyo dyan? Anong manpower well, complement niyo? Uh, normally, a provincial office would have uh, 10 to 15 employees. How many do you have in Cebu, for Cebu province? Uh, Cebu could, like, I don't have the exact number, but... Give me a good guess. Or, or maybe 20 to 30 for, this, for the province only, Mr. Chairman. Because oh. the regional office is another unit, but in base in Cebu. Sa price monitoring lang at saka sa standards monitoring, hirap na hirap na kayo dyan. Uh, we do our best. Uh, uh, but at least one is in enforcement and monitoring, and another one is on <coughs> price monitoring. One? Yes. One? In the province, yeah. <laughs> but urban cities, big cities would have more than one. <laughs> How many would you have for Cebu City? I can check that <laughs> in part. Check, uh, check yeah. that and get back to me. Yeah. Uh, also, Mr. Chair, do they really have to come back to Congress every time to uh, revisit the law? Uh, the Philippine national standards. Why can uh, Congress not devolve this power to uh, the DTI to keep on upgrading? Because if you have to come back to Congress, it'll take you five to ten years to pass an amendment to, to the law. The Congress has given the Tariff Commission, is there a tariff? Yes, Tariff Commission has the power to uh, increase and, and decrease tariffs. Can you imagine if they had to come back to us every time they had to do that? So I was just wondering if it is possible for us uh, to just devolve that power to the DTI or any other uh, government agency, so that they don't, so that they can react instantaneously, they can upgrade, keep up with world standards, and at the same time not have to bother to lobby Congress for those changes. Um, Senator, let me check um, with you, Sekdimagi, but currently. Although I think the standards for steel have remained uh, practically constant for the past uh, decades, but do you need to go to Congress to, to have your standards changed, for, specifically for steel? Uh, for standards, as a general rule, not only for steel, that's with DTI already, through the Bureau of Product Standards. 
But on the other issues we discussed uh, this afternoon, like uh, the area of penalties, uh, that would need amendment of the law. Okay, like so that. for example, um, let's say the, the intensity of earthquakes start to really increase, and now we need to have stronger steel. The Bureau of Product Standards can issue uh, that our standards are now higher, for example. It doesn't have to go to Congress. No, no need. We, we uh, have a technical committee of all stakeholders that really discusses uh, amendments, revisions, introductions. And you can do that on your own, no? And we do that on our own, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That would be all. Uh, thank you, Senator Osmeña. All right, uh, what we'll be doing is uh, we obviously want to check this on, on the ground. No? So uh, I hope that uh, when we call for that uh, spot check time and you'll take the time to really uh, check with us whether it's the warehouses or the hardware stores. Um, but in the meantime, we'll be calling for a, we're suspending the hearing. We're we'll called for a TWG. I hope our report on this can really be a, um, uh, we can have all the stakeholders coming together and really talking about what solutions we can do. Now, the next hearing will probably be six months to eight months from now. And I'm hoping that our efforts can really yield results in the market. And we can again come back with our data and see if uh, indeed the efforts of BOC, the, the new system with BIR and DTI, our monitoring with... Um, DTI as well will really yield the results that we want to see. At the same time, I'm hoping that from then, from now until then, we can also uh, remind and instruct the public regarding uh, patronizing substandard materials and how this can actually put their own lives in danger. And of course, our friends from PAR, uh, I hope that in the Build Back Better program, we are using the proper materials to make sure that uh, it is indeed better this time around. No? So I'd like to thank uh, especially Senator Smenya for attending the hearing and all of you. Uh, we're suspending the hearing in the meantime. We invite you all to the TWG and we'll see you in a few months for our follow-up. Thank you very much.